Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today we're going to be taking a look at the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with close analysis of Chapter 8, The Last Night. Utterson is surprised by the arrival at his home of Jekyll's butler, Pool. The very arrival of Pool is surprising, but upon taking a second look at him, Utterson asks, What ails you? Clearly, Pool looks disturbed. Utterson does not inquire further about Poole's health, but about Jekyll's, recognising that Poole is disturbed by something beyond himself. A sense of mystery is created by Poole's refusal to be specific. His extreme emotional agitation is evident in his claim, I wish I may die if I like it, and his repetition of both being afraid and being unable to bear it. Stevenson employs pathetic fallacy to reinforce the sense of dread, the personified moon is described as lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, suggesting a disturbance in nature that mirrors the disturbance of Poole and the unnatural transformation of Jekyll. Stevenson develops a tone of dread and a foreshadowing of violence through the description of the trees lashing themselves along the railing. The image of self-destruction could parallel Jekyll's violent actions as Hyde and, ultimately, the taking of his own life. The servants at Jekyll's house are described as being huddled together like a flock of sheep. The simile conveys not only their fear and vulnerability, but the collective nature of both. They act as sheep because they act as one unthinking body. All the servants are terrified and driven by this emotional response rather than reason. The social and class expectations of the time are evident in the way that the servants have reached out to Utterson, one of Jekyll's friends, rather than the authorities, despite believing Jekyll to have been murdered and his murderer to have remained in the cabinet for many days. They do not conscience undermining their position with their master. Even having heard a much-changed voice within Jekyll's chamber, Utterson remains the man of reason and social propriety. He dismisses Poole's implication that Jekyll has been murdered, asking what could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Despite Poole's description of the occupier of the chamber desperately demanding a drug, Utterson's emotional response is focused on a possible breach of etiquette when he realises that Poole has an opened letter. He's deeply concerned that Poole could have compromised Jekyll's right to privacy. Utterson's concerns are consistent with Stevenson's characterisation of him as having a catholicity of good nature from chapter 1. He desires universal appropriateness of behaviour and doesn't wish to make hasty judgments even in this bleak context. Paul describes having seen the room's occupant. The effect was to make his hair stand on end like quills. The simile conveys the extent of Paul's fear. The rigidity of a quill represents how profound his shock has been as his hair has risen vertically. Poole asks Utterson, If it was my master, why had he a mask upon his face? The conditional, presented as a question, conveys Poole's incredulity. His master, Jekyll, would have no need of a mask, so it couldn't be Jekyll. The concept of a mask or disguise is one that dominates the narrative. Jekyll wears the countenance of Hyde to mask his evil actions that are incompatible with the behaviour of a Victorian gentleman. In chapter 10, Stevenson describes Jekyll wearing the body of Hyde like a thick cloak, an impenetrable mantle. Returning to his desire for reason, Utterson comes to the conclusion that Jekyll is seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. In a sense, he's correct but he doesn't appreciate that the malady is of Jekyll's making, or the nature of it. Paul protests that the person was a dwarf, and therefore cannot be the tall Jekyll. The novella's first description of Hyde was that he was a little man. Utterson and Paul acknowledge that they both believe the person in the cabinet to be Hyde. Paul describes Hyde through the zoomorphic simile, like a monkey, conveying his agile movements as well as perhaps his hairy appearance and subhuman nature, both of which are referenced elsewhere in the novella. Stevenson builds tension, even after Utterson and Poole agree to break down the door, by introducing the character of Bradshaw, Jekyll's footman, who Utterson instructs to wait by the laboratory door with a boy and some sticks in order to prevent anyone's escape. 
He gives Bradshaw ten minutes to prepare, allowing the tension of this moment to be held. Utterson and Poole listen to the footsteps on the cabinet floor, dehumanising their creator through the use of the neutral pronoun it in So It Will Walk All Day. The mystery of the cabinet's inhabitant is heightened through Poole's description of it weeping like a woman or a lost soul. The casual sexism of the female stereotype conveys a loss of control that would have been regarded as unseemly in a Victorian gentleman. The despair of a lost soul would be consistent with the representation of Hyde as having Satan's signature upon his face. Utterson's warning that he intends to enter the cabinet, if not by fair means, then by foul, if not of your consent, then by brute force, is based on two juxtaposed conditionals. The mirroring of the conditionals could prepare the reader for the duality of Jekyll and Hyde. This sense of duality is reinforced by the antithetical parallelism of not by fair means, then by foul, with the opposites representing the warring qualities of good and evil within Jekyll. The reference to fair and foul could function as an intertextual allusion to the witch's speech in Macbeth, fair is foul and foul is fair, again a form of parallelism that references the supernatural, transformation and moral ambiguity, given the assertion that good is evil and evil is good. Hyde is dehumanised once again as Utterson's axe strikes the door and a dismal screech as of mere animal terror is heard. Hyde's presented as a creature of emotion rather than reason, a stark contrast to Utterson, who could be argued to act as his double, a man of reason rather than emotion. The contrast between the riot of Utterson's axe blows and the stillness that follows is shocking. The cabinet is described as the quietest and most commonplace in London, with the superlatives reinforcing the contrast to the violent acts just committed and again capturing the theme of opposites. Hyde has taken his own life through a poison, although Stevenson maintains the focus on Hyde as a violent creature through the description of him as a self-destroyer. Stevenson develops the novella's sense of mystery by an extended description of Utterson and Poole's inability to find Jekyll's body. Their discovery of one of Jekyll's favourite pious books, covered in blasphemy written in Jekyll's own handwriting, develops the mystery still further. On Jekyll's desk is a large envelope addressed to Utterson, containing a variety of documents. The first is Jekyll's will, with Jekyll's estate now being left to Utterson rather than Hyde. A further mystery is established given that Hyde did not destroy this. The second item is a note, with that day's date, revealing that Jekyll was alive that morning. It informs Utterson that Jekyll will have disappeared, and that Utterson should read the narrative given to him by Lanyon, and then his own confession, another item in the envelope. Secret messages and texts within texts are a key feature of the Gothic. Stevenson's use of Lanyon's narrative and Jekyll's will to form the two final chapters helps provide a sense of verisimilitude to these incredible accounts, rendering the science fiction more believable and therefore shocking. Okay, tough.